safety bill up, so I always make sure that um, uh, there's a Y in there, uh, so it's Camellia Gillespie and Kathy Bacon for announcement. Um, so thanks again for inviting me uh, to be uh, here today. I do not have a technical background, um, but I have been doing work related to diversity, equity, and inclusion for the vast majority of my career. Um, because I believe very strongly in it. And this is an area that we continue to struggle with um, in all industries um, in terms of getting more women in, um, in the in technical fields, um, so throughout the, the kind of STEM fields, if you will. So just a little bit about me, and I'm, I'm, I'm typically walking around, but I see this camera, and so I can't walk around. So if I look a little awkward, it's for that reason. Um, because I'm, I'm used to being all over the place when I do a presentation. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me. I am originally from Champaign. I'm a native of Champaign, Urbana. I know, very rare. I'm, a, I'm not a, uh, you don't typically meet individuals um, from Champaign. Um, but I was born and raised here. Um, I stayed here uh, for college and for graduate school and for law school. Um, I grew up in a working class family. Um, my father worked at a factory, uh, Kraft, and my mother um, initially stayed at home. I have five siblings, um, so initially stayed at home because it was much cheaper than they could, right? Um, and then once we were all in school, she went back to school and got her nursing degree and uh, eventually retired as a registered nurse. Um, so like I said, I, uh, I, when I graduated from high school, I started here as a sociology pre-law major. I had always planned to go to law school. That was always my, probably since middle school, um, that was my plan. I really didn't know what area of law that I wanted to go to. And so um, in undergrad, I had an opportunity to participate in a research program. Um, and so started looking at equity issues within the Champaign Urbana School. That was my research focus. I worked with um, a faculty member in the College of Education and Educational Policy Studies Department, uh, Dr. Anderson, who just recently retired. And that really changed my trajectory. That doing that research uh, program really changed uh, my career trajectory. Because I, like I said, I planned to go to law school, but you know, I was thinking kind of traditional areas of law. Um, and uh, having had that opportunity, I decided that I wanted to do something related to education and law. Um, and so, uh, from undergrad. I did a graduate degree in educational policy studies um, jointly with my law degree. This is one of the few universities that has that opportunity. Um, and so while my plan was to finally leave Champaign um, <laughs> after graduating from college, I ended up being here for another four years. Um, but it worked out. My husband and I had just started dating um, at the time, and I had already told him, look, if I leave, this is over. I don't do long distance relationships. And so, um, so it worked out you know, that, that I stayed because here we are 20 something years later, um, you know, having been married for, I mean, I don't know, he keeps up with it better than I do. Um, and so, uh, so did the joint degree program, uh, finished that program up. Um, and moved to Buffalo, New York. And so I finally, I'm, I'm done with Champagne, right? So I uh, studied for the bar there, and then within less than two years, we moved back here. <coughs> totally like my husband for moving back to this area. But he was offered a faculty position, um, so we moved back here. So now I had a dilemma, right? Because I really wanted, my plan was to practice school law or education law. School law is working with K-12 school systems. Um, education law is working in higher ed. Um, and moving back to Champaign, the opportunities in those areas were very limited. In fact, really non-existent, unless you had some prior experience, which I didn't have. 
And so I contemplated for a while um, um, going back and forth between here and Chicago because those, that's where most of the opportunities were. Um, and then I, you know, ultimately, you know, we just decided we want to start a family that's just not going to be feasible for starting a family. And so decided to um, use kind of the, the education policy part of my training to work at the university. And so I've been at the university uh, since 2003. Um, again, working in various aspects of, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So I started doing this work actually trying to increase the representation of women and underrepresented <coughs> minorities in STEM fields. Um, so I worked in the, the College of Engineering um, for a couple of years. I worked on um, an, an NSF grant um, in the College of Engineering that uh, and created some um, kind of pipeline kinds of programs in order to introduce students at the high school level to engineering fields, um, particularly mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, computer science, um, those areas in particular. And so um, created some programs that allowed partnerships with schools in the Chicago area that were predominantly women or predominantly uh, racial minority students um, and created some opportunities for those participants to come to the university, participate in various programs. Um, and then, um, and, and we also collaborated with a few uh, historically black colleges and universities um, to uh, encourage graduate students uh, to come here as well. For graduate school, then ultimately uh, to increase the diversity of the faculty, right, in these areas. And so I stayed in that role for a few years and then um, had my son. That position required a lot of travel, um, which I didn't realize that it should be working, okay, but it required a lot of travel, so I left that position and worked in uh, the Dean of Students' office working to. Um, help to guide students who were dealing with some sort of issue um, that would impact their ability to continue their education. Um, and so, so I love that position. It required a lot of policy interpretation, which I absolutely love doing. Um, anything that allows for legal or policy interpretation, that's the, those are the kinds of roles that, um, uh, that I really find joy in. And so whether it was interpreting various academic policies, interpreting uh, various state laws um, to make sure that students are having the opportunities to be successful here, um, that they have access to, um, uh, you know, to this education here at the University of Illinois. Um, and just realizing just some of the challenges that many students had, um, whether it was not having secure housing here because they could not afford it, um, having significant health issues, and trying to navigate um, managing classes and so forth, you know, uh, with those health issues, um, whether it was being part of a religious minority and having to. Um, communicate with faculty who may not have wanted to observe their religious observances if they miss a class or um, an exam or something along those lines. Um, and then I also uh, uh, created a program to invite the community to report incidents of bias on campus. Um, so I uh, created that, that program um, so that we could we can start responding to incidents of bias that students, faculty, um, and or staff were experiencing um, on campus. And it could be anything from, you know, a student is walking along the quad and somebody else a slur or walking along Green Street. And how do we respond to that? How do we make sure that members of our community feel like they're members of our community, right? And so, um, so, 
created that and, and managed that, that program for a number of years and actually in my current role um, continued to manage it in its new iteration. Um, and then I also created a mediation program. So one of the things that I did mention is that when I was in law school, I knew that I was not going to do litigation. That was just not an area. I, I don't mind conflict. I have no issue with conflict. I actually kind of enjoy conflict. <laughs> um, but I knew that I just didn't want to do litigation. And so I really <clears throat> focused on um, opportunities to do mediation or arbitration negotiations because typically issues are relationship involved, right? And um, those opportunities for conflict, resulting conflict, allows for the relationship to continue, whereas um, litigation oftentimes is very adversarial. Um, and it really strains relationships, you know, pretty significantly. And so I, I knew that I wanted to do something related to mediation, arbitration, and negotiation. And so when I had the opportunity, still in the, in the dean of students office, to create a mediation program for the campus, I jumped at it. Um, and so in that position, I was able to not only facilitate mediations, but also increase the capacity of individuals who were able to do mediation on campus by developing a mediation curriculum and um, doing kind of a train the trainer you know, program to uh, encourage individuals, primarily um, because it was mostly student facing, so primarily students to become peer mediators. Um, and then I had um, an opportunity to move into what I consider to be a really ideal position that, that nicely married my educational uh, uh, training. And that was in the Office for Access and Equity. Um, so there I was able to work on, um, you know, and it sounds like, like why would you want to uh, uh, investigate complaints of discrimination and harassment? Um, but I, I did. I, and I, it was an opportunity to, to marry my knowledge of the law with um, uh, interpreting and applying educational policies. Um, and so I assumed that position, and like I said, I investigated complaints of discrimination and harassment that were filed both uh, by individuals um, within the university as well as by individuals um, who may have had some sort of interface but filed with a state or federal agency. And when I assumed this position, someone said, why would you just want to listen to people complain all the time? Um, and you know, I suppose you know you could look at it that way in some sense. But for me, it was how do you make sure again that individuals who are have been marginalized, right? And um, whether it's in uh, particular disciplines or whether it's marginalized with regard to having access to the university at all, how do we make sure that those individuals truly are members of this community and can be members of this community you know, without um, experiencing discrimination or harassment. And so for me, it, it was, it is really, really important to make sure that we have an institution, that we have a university um, that values the, the diversity that we have within the university. Um, and so, uh, you know, when someone feels as though they are not being treated um, the same as others within their department or the same as others in their, in their classroom because they're an international student or because they're one of two individuals um, who speak Korean in their workplace or because they have a disability or because they um, are one of a few women or African American or Latinas or whatever the identity is, we need to address that. We need to respond to that. And we need to take it seriously. And so for me, in assuming that role, it was how do we make the university the best place to work, if you will? Um, 
And, and I, I took that very seriously, um, obviously. Um, and so while, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, that complaint is, is not going anywhere. That's not, you know, that, that person is just being super sensitive. Well, why is it that they're being sensitive about this issue? And let's explore what's going on, you know, in that work environment that's making this person who's filing this complaint feel as though um, they don't belong, you know, in this department. Um, and so it, it really gave me an opportunity to not only interpret and apply the laws that protect our civil rights, right, um, but also to try to create classroom environments and work environments um, that created practices that uh, foster a sense of belonging for the members of the community who were part of, you know, those departments. Um, and they kind of, uh, along those lines, I also had an opportunity to um, facilitate accommodations for faculty and staff who have disabilities who are pregnant and may need accommodation as a result of their pregnancies um, or who, who might need religious accommodations. And so, um, so again, uh, being able to be an advocate, be a voice on behalf of individuals who have been marginalized and but for these these laws that exist would still be uh, marginalized or excluded, you know, in ways that don't contribute to creating this wonderful, diverse um, environment that we have right now. Um, so, in my in my current position as uh, the director of uh, campus culture and climate, um, I try to work with units to try to address issues before they even arise. So, I do a lot of this. Is, telling my, my friends over here that this is a really somewhat uncomfortable position for me because I, I talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion all day long. And I love talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. I don't talk about myself. Uh, and so this is, a, a, is an awkward position for me to be in. But, um, but it's important. I, I wanted the opportunity to do this because it's important. The work that I do is not my work. It's everybody's work. Um, in order to get to where we need to be with regard to our campus representing the diversity of the state and of the nation and of the world, everybody has to do this work. It cannot just be the work of my, of me and my colleagues, right? And so anytime that I have the opportunity to talk about how can we do this work, I accept those opportunities. Um, because um, they, we don't have these conversations, you know, enough. We diversity is is sometimes for some people very difficult to talk about. Um, is we've seen it politicized. Um, we see it being politicized now, um, all over, you know, in in various states with regard to um, whether it's talking about um, uh, decreasing who's coming into the country whether it's talking about uh, trans issues, um, LGBT, LGBTQ more broadly, um, issues related to race. We, we shy away from these conversations, but it's really, really important um, that we have these conversations, and particularly in areas of tech where these conversations are not happening at all. Um, various uh, agencies have certainly tried to have these conversations, have tried to um, encourage uh, uh, those institutions that are getting funding, so NSF, NIH, so forth. They have a component, uh, a diversity component, you know, where they're encouraging, you know, these kinds of conversations in order to encourage an increase in the diversity of, of these professions. But we're still not having them we're just so afraid that we're going to say something wrong, we're going to do something wrong, we're going to be offensive to someone, but we, we have to have it. And in and, and trying to create a spaces, a spaces that are equitable, spaces that are inclusive, you can't, you can't do that without having these conversations. And so 
in my current position, as I started to say, I work with units um, to have these conversations to help facilitate these conversations more substantively related to DEI. Um, but to also take a look at their environments. And so I work with units to uh, do climate assessments, to assess what the experiences are of members of their community, um, how members of their community um, uh, are interpreting their efforts related to DEI, or if they even believe that the unit is doing anything related to, to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so, and, and oftentimes what I find is that actually in every single climate assessment that I've done, um, is that individuals who are underrepresented in the space are the ones who are experiencing bias, who are experiencing microaggressions, um, who are experiencing greater incidents of marginal, marginalization, who are experiencing um, not feeling as included within the work environment or the classroom environment as others who are, um, who are part of the majority. Um, and so we know that that is, that is a trend. We know that individuals who are underrepresented um, are going to have very different experiences than those who are well represented within an organization. And so because we know that, we, we have a greater obligation to try to minimize that gap, right? To minimize the gap of who is represented in the space. Um, and we have to be very intentional about that. Um, and so, so that's my, my role, to help units to figure out how are we more intentional about increasing the diversity of our unit. Um, and more importantly, it's, it's one thing to increase the diversity, but it's more important to make sure that practices are equitable and that the environment is an inclusive environment for everyone you know, who's, a, who's a part of, of, of that environment. Um, with regard to women in tech, we know that women continue to be vastly underrepresented. And there have been some really good studies that have been conducted um, that even, you know, is even talking about um, uh, that relative to even just a few years, that women are even more underrepresented than they were in 2018, according to this, this study, um, which is concerning. Um, because we, we have been moving in a direction where in, in uh, areas like chemistry, um, in areas like biology, we were getting to a point where there was some level of gender parity. In engineering, we we're still seeing very, very small numbers, uh, percentages of women um, in uh, areas like physics or physics or, or nuclear or you know those areas we still see very small numbers. But what's more, what's most concerning is that the the opportunities um, are very much in the technical areas. And so if we don't make a concerted effort to increase the representation of women in these areas, we're going to continue to see huge gaps um, as uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics just released a report um, not long ago, I believe in 2020, the 2022 report, that shows that what are the jobs that are, are, are um, growing at fastest rates. And those jobs are in technical fields. Um, those are the jobs that are growing at really, really high rates, higher than average rates. Um, and so, if companies, if the university is, um, if we're not diligent about um, being intentional about increasing the representation of women, the representation of other underrepresented groups in this area, we will continue to see this gap increase. Um, and so you all, as, as women in this area, as women in technology, really have a very significant role, you know, to make sure that that we're doing that. Um, my experience has been that um, when individuals who are in um, who are in the group that's underrepresented are in leadership positions, that's when you start to see 
increases in the representation of individuals within an organization. So if you have a, a supervisor or you have um, uh, the department head who is a woman, who is part of um, a marginalized group, then you also start to see increases in the representation of those, of those groups. So for instance, um, as a supervisor, I make it a point, right, to make sure that there's pay equity um, among my staff. I, some, a few years ago, I hired about five individuals, four of four women, one was a man. None of the women negotiated, not a one. The man negotiated, I adjusted everybody's pay to be that of the, man's, of the, the, the man that I hired. Um, because they, they were all hiring, I hired them all for the same position. Um, but for the women, it was a promotion for them, and so they thought, this is an increase in what I'm getting already, and so I'm good, and there's no need to negotiate. Um, but, but we know from the research that men always negotiate, and women are not as comfortable, um, uh, and not as comfortable doing that. Um, the same thing, you know, with regard to uh, making sure that um, I'm creating a flexible work environment for um, my employees. Um, I, some years ago, again, before the pandemic, um, I, would, I would have to fight for, you know, my employees to work from home. I would have to fight with HR for my employees to work from, from home. Um, you know, so, of course, employee has a sick child at home, you can still work at home with a sick child. A sick child is typically going to be <coughs> sleeping for the majority of the day, is going to be, um, unless it's a small, small child, is not going to be interfering. And so HR's policy was always that um, if, if, if an employee works from home, you need to be able to account, right, for the work that they're doing. You know, my position was, do I have any reason to believe that this employee is not going to do the same great work that she's been doing in the office um, at home. But what ends up happening when we don't allow for those flexible policies and practices is, is, is this oftentimes this mom tax, right? Because it's typically the mother who is staying home with the child, who is taking the child you know, to the doctor's appointments. Not always. I mean, I have a very involved husband. But at the same time, I'm usually doing the majority of the care that's required for, I used to, I mean, he's 18 now. Um, but uh, I, I did the majority of that care for my child, whether it's making the doctor's appointments, taking him to the doctor's appointment, or dental appointments, or whatever it is. And so what ends up happening is that you have um, this, this parent who is having to miss more work than her male counterparts. And as a result of that, is not as likely to be tapped for committees, is not as likely um, to be given particular projects. Um, if it's perceived that she's missing more work than her own, it's to have an impact on uh, their, their career trajectory, right? And so, so being mindful of the policies that exist that continue to widen this opportunity gap and therefore the pay gap um, that that men, men and women oftentimes experience, you know, in the workplace, um, and so I again work with the units to help them to think about um, what their policies and practices are, um, and if there are any that are perpetuating inequities um, in their particular uh, department, and how we can address those inequities. Um, and how, what are the practices to make sure that individuals um, do feel as though it's, a, it's an inclusive, you know, work environment. Um, and so, you know, uh, so that's kind of what I do. Um, sorry, again, this is, this is not my usual, um, but I'm um, happy to take any questions that we have. I'm ready. That was a little bit faster. There. You can move around if you want. All right. I have a question. You, you talked about earlier in your career. Um, <coughs> you worked on improving diversity and was down for the College of Engineering. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a lot of startup companies here in our business incubator. What advice would you give them in terms of creating more inclusive environments? And I know that's probably a topic that can be its own thing, but it's just <laughs> good. 
Um, so one of the things that I think is really important for creating an inclusive work environments is to see, to do an assessment as to whether you rely on certain individuals more than other individuals. And if in doing so, you're giving certain individuals greater opportunities for growth than you are other individuals within the work environment. Um, I think it's really important to make sure that um, you take a look at your team and determine whether you are growing every member of that team in the same way um, or whether uh, you have some partiality and maybe it's it maybe you don't realize it right but whether you have some partiality to certain members of your team and it might be because this person is super super productive or this person is really really well liked by colleagues across campus but as supervisors it's our role to grow every member of our team and to support every member of our, of our team. And so I make it very clear um, to, uh, to my employees that what do you need? What do you need to grow? Um, and how can I facilitate um, making sure you get what you need? When I hire somebody, it's not to see them fail, right? It's to see them succeed. And so what is my role in helping uh, those individuals to succeed? Because if they feel as though um, I have the kind of support that I need to succeed, then more than likely, and again, research supports this, they feel as though they, they are a meaningful part of, um, of, of the department. The other thing is, um, I mentioned that every climate study that I've done, that uh, individuals who are underrepresented uh, share that they've experienced microaggressions. <coughs> Um, and so it's really important that when those microaggressions occur, if you're in that space where they're occurring, and it might be something like um, someone's talking over someone constantly um, and disregarding <coughs> what that individual was saying, address that in the moment. And you can address it in a way that does not call out the person or does not make that person feel uncomfortable, but just saying, hey, Laura is, um, Laura is making a comment, and I really want to hear what her comment is. Um, and so could you, let's let, let her finish making that comment that, you know, that she's making. Um, or pulling the person to the side and saying, I notice that every time women speak, that you interrupt them. Um, we want to make sure that we're giving everyone an opportunity to contribute to the conversations that we're having, you know, in, in, in the meeting. Um, so whatever those microaggressions are, even if you're the one who's committing the microaggression, because sometimes we do, right, unknowingly. Um, so even if you're the one uh, committing that microaggression, taking a step back, trying to understand why did this person interpret this as a microaggression, let me try to understand where they're coming from, let me try to put myself, you know, in their shoes um, and, and, and address this so I don't do it again. Right. So I think that those are just some small ways um, and easy ways. Sometimes interrupting microaggressions can feel confrontational, but it, they don't, it doesn't have to be. I mean, it's, it's all about the approach, um, you know, and, and using it as an opportunity to educate someone rather than as an opportunity to call someone out and say, um, you know, how dare you, you know, do this. And so, those are just some ways, but like you said, I can do a, an entire presentation um, um, in the place of working. Yeah. 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 Go ahead. Okay. Um, I was listening to the news when they were talking about a lot of the DNI initiatives, and I think it was one state, I believe it was Florida, where they are going to execute you or go with this. I was like, what are your overall thoughts on that? You know, again, I. I as I said at the outset, DEI has become so politicized, and I think Florida is a great example of how it's been politicized. I mean, diversity is important. It's, it's, there have been so many studies done, both um, academic studies as well as uh, industry studies that showed just how important diversity is 
to an organization, to the organization's productivity, to uh, um, innovation. innovation, that's right, to representation. I mean, again, I could do a whole presentation of why diversity is important. Um, you know, and for these states um, to create legislation to try to not only minimize the opportunities for talking about and encouraging diversity, but for minimizing the individuals who are impacted. So, so one of the pieces of legislation, or one of the issues that's going on the board right now is that they're introducing um, an AP African American history course, right? And so um, this course has been in the works for some years now with some of the best scholars uh, working on creating the content for this course. And Florida, you know, is saying, no, no. We, we're not having AP African American history. Yet, we have AP US history, right, that is, um, is, is not a, a complete representation of US history. We have European history, right? I mean, we have, at least in the state of Illinois, we have education around the Holocaust. Um, and so we need to understand the histories of everybody in the United States. We tell ourselves as a nation um, of, of being a nation that celebrates diversity, but when it comes down to let's learn about these histories of, of all these different populations, because they're, they're poor histories, right? I mean, the U.S. has a, a, um, a history of exclusion for many, many groups of people. Um, and so, so when you're talking about African American history, inevitably, you have to talk about African American history that is inclusive of slavery and Jim Crow and segregation and all kinds of marginalization. And sometimes that can be difficult for people to come to terms with that this is the history of this country. Um, but it's really important um, because we need to understand why we are where we are today. And we don't, we can't have that understanding if we don't incorporate these kinds of things into the curriculum. Um, the same thing with uh, minimizing LGBTQ um, issues within the curriculum. These are all members of our communities, you know, and so to not, again, acknowledge um, the role and the presence of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender individuals, not only does it marginalize, further marginalize uh, that community, but anyone who is an ally to that community, um, anyone who may have, um, um, you know, family members, you know, who are part of that community, and so again, this this approach to um, minimizing and marginalizing identities is is one that I think is is out of here is. So I feel kind of funny asking this question because that's a very serious topic that we just addressed. And I do think that as a, as a state and as a community that we can actually um, take advantage of the fact that this is a, such a warm and welcoming place for our startups and hopefully and, and tech companies, et cetera, and hopefully you all feel that way. And if there's anything we can do to make a difference with that, let us know. But my question was is that um, I don't know if this would be considered a microaggression. I don't think so, as the definition as I understand. But one of the things that I think many women in tech or women in general in the workplace face is, I hate to say it, but mansplaining. 
And I just was in a situation where this happened to me and I probably very aggressively called it out because let's just face it, I'm old and I don't care anymore. But um, do you have any advice to those of us who've been in those situations who maybe, how do we address it in a way that's productive? I think that is how you address it. I, and you have to call it out. And, and the reason for that, and, and I say call it in rather than call it out. Because, and the difference is that when you're calling it out, you're saying, how dare you, right? And when people say, how dare you, we become defensive um, with that approach. But when you call it in, it's more of a, let me tell you how this made me feel and why it was problematic to me. So it's more of an educational conversation so that the person is more aware of it the next time that he tries to do that. Um, but, it's, but oftentimes we're, when we're in positions of privilege, when we're in the majority, we don't see these things. Um, we don't see that I'm interrupting women you know, I'm interrupting um, people of color. We don't see those unconscious biases that we have. Um, and so, so you have to point out those biases when you see them um, so that individuals become aware of their own biases. Um, again, I, I do a lot of conversations around implicit bias. And because of it, I become aware of my own biases, right? But without you, Without you bringing it into that person's attention, they're going to continue to do it. One of the, um, I'll, I'll provide these two reports that talk about women in the workplace. They're really, really good reports. One is done by McKinsey, um, which is a company that has done a lot of really good work on, on DEI. And the other is a, a, a study and report by Great Places to Work. Um, but the McKinsey report you know, talked about um, how women in tech in particular are oftentimes um, their expertise is minimized um, and <clears throat> and despite having the same level or even greater levels of expertise than their male colleagues um, that expertise is not recognized in the same way um, in, in tech fields and so um, so, so you have to you have to have the conversation, um, you know, when that happens. Otherwise, the person may be completely oblivious to it, and the person may not care. You know, you may bring it to the person's attention, <coughs> and the person may say, "Okay, whatever, get over it," or you're being super sensitive, you know, about whatever. Um, but you you have to um, not only to in an effort to try to prevent that from having anything to you, but to others within, you know, the word, other women within the world. Um, similar to what was just asked. Uh, similar to what uh, was just asked, I know there's um, studies showing that um, with men perceive there, there to be more women in the room, even if there's only like five of them or that they speak more uh, when it's statistically more probable that women don't actually speak up at all. Um, so uh, I just wanted to, as someone who comes from um, India where in, uh, English is an official language but it's not recognized everywhere, um, I think that it's almost always worse when the woman speaking is um, has an accent or is from somewhere that doesn't have English as a primary language um, and the microaggressions are almost always worse when it's like that um, so any advice on that any thoughts on that um, so let me make sure that I understand uh, what your question is um, so there is and you're absolutely right the uh, research supports that um, there's uh, again, in any situation, um, that the perception of the majority is always inflated, right? And so again, if you are part of the majority and you're in a space 
um, in which there is some actual representation, your perception of the, whether it's the, the actual representation of those who are underrepresented and the group who's always appointed, your, your perception of participation of those who are underrepresented in the group tends to be inflated. Um, this has nothing to do with this conversation, but um, I was just listening to a segment on reparations, and uh, they were talking about the study that was just, uh, was the kind of study that was just done, and it showed that um, white individuals felt that, that black individuals were doing way better than what, what they are within society, right? And so, that the wealth gap wasn't as wide, even though the wealth gap continues to widen. Um, and so that that perception um, is is very well documented. Um, um, I you know it's I think the only way to to try to address um, the perception that something is more than what it is is to is to be in the trenches doing this work. Um, to, to educate yourself, uh, to know that, again, if, if you're in the majority, you have, to some degree, a responsibility to try to, if you're in the majority and you want to make strides in this work, in terms of increasing the representation of women in, in, um, in STEM fields, um, in terms of making sure that you're creating an inclusive work environment or classroom environment, you have to do the work. And so that means educating yourself. And if you take the time to educate yourself, you'll realize that, again, these there have been tons of studies on these, on, on these issues that continue time and time and time again you know, to show that, um, that these perceptions are, are, are very inaccurate. Um, and uh, and don't align, the perceptions don't align with the reality of the statistics. Um, it's the same thing with pay equity. There's a perception. Um, men believe that, that pay equity is, is, is more on par than what it is. Um, but again, you look at the research and it's, we're still not. Um, there are significant pay inequities among um, men and women, and then you start drilling down even more with regard to race or uh, transgender women, um, and it's even greater, right? Um, but that's not the perception. The perception is we, we've come so far, and we're at a point where there is parity, but it's, it's, it's not, you know, there's not. Um, so so my, my answer is really, you know, those individuals really have to do the work themselves to really, to understand um, what the research says as opposed to relying on, on that perception that's inaccurate. So I can, I can stand here and talk all day long, so you won't tell me you were I was just going to ask uh, a question about something that you mentioned earlier. Uh, talk. It was about uh, your story about how you uh, hired five people, one of them being men, and the four of being, uh, being uh, women. The man was the only one that negotiated for uh, higher pay. And I've also heard, too, that women are much less likely to uh, apply for jobs that feel like they're underqualified, but men are much more likely to feel like, oh, I don't get all these qualifications. Yeah, they're like, I'll still apply. So I'm curious as to, like, what's what um, advice do you give to, uh, to women out there that do feel that way? They feel like, oh, I'm underqualified, but they shouldn't feel like they should give themselves that chance. And like, what's going to be changing mindset? So, a couple of things. Um, one is that when I um, when I talk to units, one of the things that I talk about, and particularly with regard to increasing the diversity um, of the department, is to pay attention to job descriptions and the language that is, job, is in job descriptions because we know um, that uh, the language can be very ginger 
there's actually an app that Ginger, I think what is it called, Ginger decodes job um, descriptions, and so it takes out any gendered language, and I can't think of it right now. You could look up gendered language and job descriptions and probably find it. Um, but one of the things that I talk about with units is to make sure that you're really paying attention to how the job description is written, to make sure that there's not any coded language in the job description. And so sometimes using language like, um, we want someone who's compassionate and you know, tends to draw more women. We want someone who is a go-getter and eager. Uh, women tend to read those job descriptions as looking for male candidates and, and therefore, to your point, don't apply. Um, or if they believe that I don't meet all of the qualifications and so therefore I can't apply. Um, you know, and, and that is, I mean, when I, sorry, I have a, a presentation coming up with a, a, a group of uh, women who are part of this program um, that, that, part of a leadership program that is intended to help them to grow. And so one of the things that I, I talk about, you know, is put yourself out there. Let the other person, let the employer say, no, you're not qualified. But the other piece is, and the, the other piece is really important, is that um, we know that if the applicant pool is not diverse to begin with, that it's less likely that a woman will be hired from that applicant pool. It's less likely that uh, someone who is a minority will be hired from that applicant pool, someone who has a disability, someone, whatever. Um, and so, so it's really, really important at the outset to make sure that you're getting as diverse of an applicant pool as possible. There was one study that was done that talked about if there are at least two women in the, um, who are finalists, um, it's 79 times more likely that a woman would be higher than if it's just one woman in the finalist pool. Um, and it increases even more for other, um, other groups. Um, and so making sure, particularly in tech fields, particularly for tech um, positions, making sure that before the committee even starts to review those applications, that it's a diverse pool of candidates. And if it's not, to continue to invite applicants to apply for the position, um, and to continue to try to be even more intentional about where those applicants are coming from. Um, you know, so, so they're so doing some very intentional recruiting um, in order to try to increase the diversity of the applicant pool. Someone who has small children 
can't make it to a 7.30 a.m. meeting, um, or might not be able to travel, you know, again, as much as the person who has no children, or may not be able to stay at work until 8, 10 at night, um, you know, in comparison to someone who has no children. So short answer to your question, yes. But the other piece, um, at the time, and honestly, was also like, pulling teeth <laughs> um, to get uh, some of the faculty to buy into the work that was being done. Um, there just wasn't, it wasn't the kind of investment in diversity, equity, and inclusion that I think we see now. Now this was, you know, back in 2003, right? So we're 20 years later. And I think there, there is much greater investment uh, by the college in making the college more diverse um, than, than it was at that time. But, but at the time, it, it was a little bit of a challenge. And so combining you know, the, the, the travel requirements with seemingly a lack of interest in diversifying and, and trying to get more women into engineering, trying to get more um, racial minorities into engineering. It, it was, and I'm, I'm not afraid of a challenge, you know, don't get me wrong, but, um, but you, you have to see some milestones, you know, in order to, uh, to know that you're moving in the right direction. And, and, you know, certainly, perhaps we would have gotten there, but at the time it was like, <laughs> I, I need some investment, you know, from from not just the five the five faculty who seem to be really invested, but more widely I think that investment too. So thanks for that question. We're coming up on 130, so we're gonna oh, sorry. We're gonna go ahead and wrap this up. Thank you so much Thank for joining so us today. I have I always like to embarrass her. We went to high school together and I and I always tease her because she was our prom queen. <laughs> Reaching additional issues, you know, that come along with it. But we'll have you back sure. to, to talk. And as long as I don't have to talk about myself, I'm happy. To <laughs> okay. And we'll let you move around. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming today.